What is up everyone? I'm Al Barris with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest Region and you are listening to Shop Talk. For this episode we are talking shop with fish biologists at the Williams Creek National Fish Hatchery and you can hear the waters of that creek flowing through the hatchery incubation facility here on the Fort Apache Reservation in eastern Arizona where the service is working with the tribe to restore Apache trout. For the uninitiated, Arizona may seem an unlikely fishing destination. When conjuring images of Arizona, the Grand Canyon and saguaro cacti come to mind. Not so much cold water brooks and alpine climbs where trout live. However, as is the case with most things, Arizona isn't so black and white. This state is home to many fishes. There is, in fact, a fish here that can't be found anywhere else in the world. That is Arizona state fish, the Apache trout. Not normally occurring in large bodies of water, the Apache trout is native to the small cool streams around the White Mountains of eastern Arizona. This species faced extinction due to competition from non-native trout which were introduced for recreation. Listed under the Endangered Species Act of 1973, the Apache trout is among those first species to gain federal protection. In 1975, the species was downlisted to threatened, which opened the door for recreation. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest Region fish biologists continue to work to restore this unique creature to its original habitat and to supply the trout for recreation, as explained by Zachary Jackson, the project coordinator and supervisory fish biologist for the White River Station of the services Arizona Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. Several service programs come together to further Apache trout conservation, the ecological services program, works on threatened and endangered species issues. The Arizona Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office uh, works to implement recovery actions, uh, working closely with our partners. And then the hatchery program also plays a role in production for Apache trout as well as producing an Apache trout stock that could be used for recovery purposes. Over the course of time, um, you know, there were a number of threats to Apache trout, maybe most significant where uh, there was probably some overfishing early on in their, in their history. They were very popular as well as other sport fish were introduced into their range and really constricted their habitat to the headwaters of their uh, native range. Um, those non-native trout that were introduced for improved sport fishing opportunities, they have a few different interactions with Apache trout that, that negatively affect them. The Apache trout has very much become an underdog in its own neighborhood. Rainbow and brook trout were brought in and compete with Apache trout for food and space and interbreed with them. Complicating recovery further, rainbow, brook, and brown trout remain favorites for many recreational anglers. It can be difficult to convince outdoorsmen to give up on a large game fish for a smaller trout that is listed as threatened. There's hybridization that occurs that dilutes the Apache trout gene pool. There's competition for food and space uh, with Apache trout, and that reduces their ability to increase in abundance and be robust. And then there's direct predation by some of these non-native trout. With a coalition between federal, state, and tribal partners, recovery and conservation is moving forward. Hatcheries exist to not only ensure a strong gene pool for recovery of the trout, but also here at Williams Creek. Fish are bred for the sole purpose of recreation. Part of the recovery process involves removing the non-native trout from designated Apache trout habitat. A common way biologists remove unwanted species is through electrofishing, using voltage that attracts and temporarily stuns fish. They're also using new technology to learn where to find those fish. We're coupling um, traditional or well-established fisheries techniques like barrier construction and maintenance to keep non-natives out of prime Apache trout habitat and non-native removals using backpack electrofishing with newer technologies like eDNA sampling. eDNA, or environmental DNA sampling, it's a, uh, in the way that we're using it, it's a technique where we can collect a sample of water 
and filter out from that particles from tissue of different living organisms and we can target what we're looking for. So the way we use it is we look for non-native trout DNA in the water and we take systematic sampling along a stream course that allow us to tell where, say, brown trout are in a system. And we usually don't employ it until we think we've gotten the brown trout population really low, um, but it allows us to find those few remaining individuals and target them for removal. While brown and rainbow trout are common game fishing staples throughout much of the U.S., Apache trout offers new opportunities for anglers the world over who will come from far and wide to catch a fish that's only found in the White Mountains of Arizona. Apache trout are important to the economy um, because there's a, a lot of folks that put a high value on capturing them and so it brings in a lot of tourist dollars to the area which is very important for the White Mountain Apache tribe. Um, it also brings in tourist dollars to the surrounding area. I think uh, native trout enthusiasts are particularly interested in uh, Apache trout because they're very rare. They, uh, we put the same value on them, many people do, that we would put on diamonds, which are also you know, extremely rare and beautiful. While the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is charged with recovering threatened and endangered species and helping to provide recreational fishing opportunities is important to further conservation efforts, the service's role is very much a supportive one in the case of this unique trout. Uh, it's critical for us to have a good, strong relationship with the White Mountain Apache tribe. Um, they were the first stewards of Apache trout. They have been leading the conservation efforts since the beginning, and our role here is uh, in a supportive role. You know, we're doing whatever we can. We're coordinating very closely with how and where we implement uh, recovery actions. We're working with the tribe to constantly evaluate our wild populations and focus efforts where um, new threats arise. Um, and uh, without that partnership, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to save the species. But Williams Creek hasn't always been for the benefit of the Apache trout. Originally, this hatchery was built to produce game trout for the tribe in the 1930s. The first year of operation, they attempted, but they failed to propagate Apache trout. And it wasn't until the 1980s that biologists were successful at breeding Apache trout there at the hatchery. Technology used at this hatchery is on the cutting edge. Williams Creek fish biologist Russell Wood explains some techniques they use to further recovery of this fish. Apache trout are difficult to raise. Uh, they're slower growing than the other species of trout uh, due to a slower metabolism. Uh, they're more susceptible to diseases, which can make them difficult to raise. Today, the hatchery staff manually spawned the trout. This process isn't normally harmful for the fish, and they spawn every year. An important part of keeping captive Apache trout is checking the ovarian fluid to look for any diseases and that comes out with the eggs. The males are also stripped of their sperm, which is called milt. The hatchery uses state-of-the-art techniques to emulate a habitat that's safe from predators and free of diseases. This morning we were spawning Apache trout. Uh, yesterday we sorted the female four-year-old Apache trout for ripeness. We had over 100 ripe fish. So this morning we got in and we essentially knocked the fish out with a drug to make it safe to handle. Her eggs are hand stripped into a colander to drain the ovarian fluid off. They are then put into a bowl and the males are stripped of their milt uh, for fertilization. And the eggs are water hardened for one hour and then put away into heat stacks, incubation stacks, to incubate. The eggs and milt mix for a while and then go on to become something greater than the sum of their parts new Apache trout embryos. The hatchery is also using some newer techniques. They're using milt harvested in the field from wild Apache trout. It's been preserved uh, in low temperatures and stored, and now they're mixing it with hatchery eggs so that they can enhance their stock that's bred primarily for recreational fishing. Yeah, this year for the first time we're trying to introduce wild genetic material from the wild back into our hatchery population. 
Uh, last year we went up in the mountains in the spring and spawned wild males and we cryopreserved their milt. Uh, it's a technology that's been used for a lot of years in the livestock industry with cattle and horses. Uh, the milt was mixed with an extender and sucked up into small straws and essentially frozen on liquid nitrogen at, at minus 300 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. This fall we had the, the cryopreserved milt shipped back to us and we've started utilizing it in our broodstock production by thawing this milt and fertilizing fish eggs with it in order to bring the wild genetics back into our population. Since Apache trout were so close to extinction, the gene pool is very limited. It's difficult to match fish that aren't closely related, and interbreeding makes the fish more susceptible to diseases. And to ensure healthy genetic pairing, they identify gene types and tag the fish with something similar to the electronic pit tag that many people get for their pets. Something about the size of a long grain of rice, and that's implanted under the skin. The service has a sort of uh, matchmaking service for Apache trout in Dexter, New Mexico. Yeah, the genetics lab at the Southwestern Native Aquatic Resource and Recovery Center, their geneticist did a, a matrix for us. We uh, took 50 of our female four-year-olds, pit tagged them, which is a passive integrated transponder tag that has a 10-digit number, just like a social security number, and a fin clip and they did genetic work to match males to females that were not related. And some of our fish that we are spawning this year for our broodstock replacement, we are utilizing this matrix, which is mating a specific male to a specific female that are the most unrelated that we have for the purpose of the greatest genetic diversity, to avoid inbreeding and breeding fish that are closely related to each other. While restoring a genetically robust Apache trout to its original habitat is the long-term goal of the service, Russell Wood agrees that this fish is important for the local tribe and for anglers, and the fish could also become more popular with cooks and people who enjoy eating fish. Well, I think the biggest importance to the tribe is, is people travel long distances just to catch an Apache trout because they're only found here. So it's a revenue for the tribe to have people from out of state or out of town travel here, spend money here to catch a fish they can only catch here. I need to eat one because I heard they're delicious. Oh, we, we stock those fish into Christmas Tree Lake here on the reservation. The tribe runs what's called Trout Camp, which is like a, a luxury camping trip with a nice tents, catered food, you know, home cooked food, and people pay money to spend a weekend fishing for these large Apache trout in Christmas Tree Lake and get taken care of by fishing guides and uh, cooks. And Russell has some tips for prospective Apache trout anglers as well. I think, you know, catching an Apache trout is going to be like catching any trout. And uh, if you're a fly fisherman, any, any of the uh, flies that we have here from uh, blue wing olives, uh, a bait fisherman, uh, a good thing to use is a white power bait. Use a small hook and very little weight and just let it drift in the current. Mm -hmm. And when you see the white power bait disappear, it's in a fish's mouth and set the hook. Bradley Clarkson is a supervisory fish biologist at Williams Creek. As both a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee and a member of the White Mountain Apache tribe, Bradley has a unique perspective in the conservation of the trout he says that the Apache people are proud to have this trout named for them. I think the the Apache people in general, on the White Mountain Apache, they like that. You know, it, it represents them as uh, an Apache tribal members out here, and they're the ones that are, you know, protecting the land mm -hmm. and the resources, mm -hmm. and having an Apache trout named after the Apache, you know, tribe, tribes not only White Mountain, but there are other Apache, tri Apache tribes in Arizona as well that pro I, I kind of think they contribute to that, mm -hmm. to for it to, to be here, and that we could, have, at least we have 13 to 14 strains. Bradley says protecting the Apache trout goes back centuries into the time of Geronimo, who was a prominent leader of the Apache Chiricahua, 
and delayed European settlement of the region until his surrender in 1886. I think probably Toronto had something to do with that as well. Uh, he kept people away. Even that's what Mount Apache, when he was around, mm -hmm. we were afraid of him as well. Because mm -hmm. my grandmother mentioned one time that her mom said when Geronimo was coming, they would want to go higher up in the mountains because they feared him. If we feared him, I'm pretty sure other folks feared him more because uh, that's how I believe he uh, protected them. My, even the land, also the resources as well, because you know it's hard to tap into it when you know yeah, the, the patches are near around somewhere. You don't want to yeah, get too far in there. So that's how the Apache trout is protected. Hmm. Not only that, but the tribe, the White Mound Apache trap as well, they, uh, I think near when it was when the Endangered Species Act might have came, came around, they were already up there along with that and protected and made it a wilderness area where you can't even take a slingshot past that boundary, or let alone a fishing pole, mm -hmm. they're ready. You get sighted right away for the, the game rangers when they come around. Mm -hmm. Here, you'll hear my colleague, Public Affairs Specialist Craig Springer, talking to Bradley Clarkson. So is there a native word for Apache trout? It's hard to say. The word we know is cluck, is named for trout. It's, it's like almost a sentence, if you want to say in Apache. Uh, this guy is Abidayo, around on Mount Baldy. That's what it is. I would say. This guy is uh, means White Mountain. So, Abidayo means around it. And there's, I know, there's 14, 13 strains around it. So that's how I would say it. Along with cultural importance, there's also a measured return on investment in the important conservation work that the service and the tribe do in working together to restore the trout. And economy-wise, every dollar that's put into hatchery, the nearby communities and, and the state, they get $19 back. For Bradley, a major aspect of this work is passing the torch to future generations. The future is looks good because right now as the staff here at Williams Creek, we finally got to where we go out and the tribe give us permission to go in there and collect wild genetics, bring it back and put it in our brood stock. We're not going to see it this year, but maybe two or three years down the road because we are finally getting our genetics put back into our spawning. Well, my supervisor sent me to the Native American meetings with other tribes. I, I suggested to bring some expertise to the hatchery and some training for our youth. And the most important one was cryopreservation because that's what we're doing. But maybe some, one of our Apache tribal members can learn to go in that field and they could pick it up from where, where we started to introduce it to the hatchery. Education. That's my main thing is I've been trying to recruit Apache tribal members by going and tapping to their high school and going to their instructors and biology teacher and ask for who's the best candidate, who has the potential. So that's how I get help by doing a, what do to pick from because uh, we only have so many spots that we could, you know, we can interview them and get them ready and find out who's really going into this field. Because I really like to see some Apache tribal men to continue from where, where I'm at right now and be uh, dedicated and have a passion for Apache tribe. Yeah. And that's the reason why I'm still here 25 years later, because I really like to contribute to the Apache Trout program. And when I'm done, I like to say to the Apache people, hey, I'm done now. Your turn. I'm, I'm, this is as far as I can go. Now i got to go rest. And maybe go fishing. <laughs> so, yeah.
That was Supervisory Fish Biologist Bradley Clarkson at the Williams Creek National Fish Hatchery on the Fort Apache Reservation in the White Mountains of Eastern Arizona for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest Region. I'm Al Barris, and that's what's up.